Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Michigan Engineering DEI lecture. This is an important element of our People First Engineering Focus, where we are committed to engaging our entire community, learning and growing together. I'm Sarah Pozzi, I'm a professor of nuclear engineering and radiological sciences, and I'm the director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for Michigan Engineering. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker for our DEI lecture today. Jayshree Sait is a corporate scientist at 3M and currently holds 76 patents for a variety of innovations. She joined 3M in 1993 after an MS and PhD in chemical engineering from Clarkson University, New York. In 2018, she was appointed to 3M's first ever chief science advocate and is using her scientific knowledge, technical expertise, and professional experience to advance science and communicate the benefits of science and the importance of diversity in STEM fields. She is the recipient of many awards, including the Society of Women Engineers Highest Achievement Award in 2020. And in addition to being an award-winning scientist, recognized thought leader and prolific speaker. She's also the author of two books and has featured in local, national, and international media. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sait. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pozzi. Um, uh, before we talk about uh, the matter at hand, I have to say I'm uh, particularly excited to present at a UMICH event. It has actually been on my mind since I presented at uh, U of M, um, the other U of M to you all, uh, that is University of Minnesota, and I have my daughter studying there, and my son actually is at UMICH, so now I feel better. Um, mommy has uh, embarrassed both of them equally. <laughs> For my daughter, of course, it was in person, um, full disclosure, I love presenting to a live audience uh, because I'm one of those people who talks with my hands. Um, if there's any hand talkers in the audience, give me a thumbs up in the chat. You are the only people who know what I mean. Uh, Zoom uh, doesn't quite cut it for us hand talkers. We have just realized that it literally cuts us off. Um, it's very interesting that we have all learned so much about ourselves, about each other, and about the world around us in these uh, two plus years. And if we zoom in, we can see a lot has changed. But if you zoom out, we see that a lot more needs to change. Uh, it was certainly an um, unprecedented time in many ways. So many lives ended. So many lives were upended. And uh, just think about it. Virtually all of humanity, we faced the same existential crisis. Uh, most of us confronted the same fears. And many of us, we all awaited the gift of science and the vaccine. And science, science uh, was in the public discourse and scientists were center stage in this evolving story of the pandemic. So I'm really honored to have the opportunity to share some of our work on public perception of science and why we think it's important for all of us to advocate for it. So first of all, let me ask you this. Uh, what do you think? Has the public perception of science changed during the pandemic? Put a yes or no in the chat. And now comes the tough question. Do you think it is more positive or more negative? Good question, isn't it? I can almost see you arguing with yourself. I'll give you the punchline. Science is currently having a moment. And there's no doubt in my mind that science will vanquish this pandemic. But during this uh, strange time that we have lived through, we have seen very clearly that science and scientists and professionals in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math have a profound impact in shaping our future. And we're actually also seeing that the global public is finally recognizing that. And that is, it is important to advocate for science and for adequate representation in STEM fields because the public expects that too. So let me explain what is going on. So during the pandemic, science skepticism declined for the first time since we started tracking it five years ago. And as you can see, it was steadily rising till before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, it is down. And trust in science and scientists is the highest it has been. So now many of you are probably thinking, good to know science is being seen in a positive light because it's great to see. Sometimes we only hear from and off a very vocal minority. And you may have all these questions, including, 
wait a minute, why is 3M doing this research? So let me back up a bit and quickly give you a little background. So at 3M, we are all about science. It's our most distinguishing characteristic. It's uh, what uh, ties our businesses together. And it's the foundational strength behind our brand, science applied to life. And our purpose at 3M is to unlock the power of people, ideas, and science to reimagine what is possible. Put that down on a post-it note. Uh, that's a 3M product and uh, scotch tape. And you might know us now for our N95 respirators, but we have a lot of products. And science is central to our sustainability framework. And so when I go to work every day and I work on my projects in the lab, they relate to science for circular, science for climate, or science for community. That's right. It's a pillar in our longstanding commitment to education and STEM equity in, in all the communities we operate in around the world. Um, for example, in 2021, we donated $43 million in cash and products uh, to education initiatives. In 2020, our CEO announced a $50 million uh, fund for social justice to close the racial inequality gap. And a key element in that itself uh, was uh, STEM equity. And uh, since this is a, the DNI seminar, why is it important to have a diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM fields? There are many reasons, right? Uh, let me give you one. We need all the diversity of thoughts and experiences we can get. Uh, to creatively solve the problems we face. It'll be 9 billion of us in just a few decades. So we really need to unlock the secrets to a sustainable future. And to do that, we can't all think the same, feel the same, be the same, or be from the uh, same background, same community, or same college for that matter. And that is one reason we need diversity. It's a matter of our survival. Uh, so we have a lot of improvement on the STEM equity front because it has a wide ranging impact, including that on the talent pipeline of companies like 3M and companies that uh, you may work at or the, for the students in the audience, the companies that you may join or you may start or you may run someday. And we at 3M are aligned with sustainable development goals. We are committed to innovation and we want to create a diverse science community and a more positive world with science and we want others to join us. So we care about science, science matters to us and we wanted to understand what the global perception around science was. And uh, we didn't find any studies that were relatively recent and were uh, global in nature. So we commissioned one. Uh, we surveyed 14 countries as shown here in late 2017, 1,000 respondents per country, and it's a representation of that country's gen pop, demographic representation of that country, and we administered this survey through Ipsos, and the results um, were really interesting, and let's just say thought-provoking. So if you want to know what the world thought about science in 2018, here it goes. Four out of 10 people surveyed globally said, if science didn't exist, their lives would be no different. And I repeat for impact, you heard me right. If science did not exist, their lives would not be any different. That's what they said. And 32% of the people call themselves science skeptics. And in this population, 60% said, if science didn't exist, their lives would be no different. Now get this. They were taking their survey on the mm -hmm, laptops or mobile phones. So yes, you can pick your jaw off the floor. It's very clear. Science is invisible. Science is underappreciated and science for taken for granted. That is the problem. People don't realize that all this wonderful technology, let's say, that they so seem to enjoy the benefits of, uh, their phones, their cars, their microwaves, their coffee machines, you know, that it's fundamental science and research and application thereof that allows them to afford these benefits. So it's quite shocking. And some of the other things that people said around the globe, I was more excited about science as a child. I mean, people think of science as this subject in middle school. Uh, many said as an adult, I really don't think there's a need for me to understand science. That explains a lot of what went on. 36% uh, of those surveyed also said only geniuses can have a career in science. So thank you, Albert Einstein, but no thanks, because who do you think? Who do you think a label like this, a label of genius deters the most? Exactly those who are underrepresented in many STEM fields. And no surprise, across the globe, women trailed men in the positive sentiment for science. You know, when we asked if you could have a satisfying career in engineering, 25% of the men agreed, but for women, it was only 9%. 
And I stand here, oh, I sit here. I sit here as an engineer, certainly not a genius by any means and with a very satisfying career in STEM. Well, I know we have our work cut out ahead of us in, in terms of the public sentiment. And especially since look at this, people want the next generation to pursue science. Very interesting. I don't care about science, not so important for me, but you go ahead, kids, you do science. How does that work? It kind of doesn't. I know as a parent, kids are watching. So although it's great to see people want their kids to know more about science and, oh my gosh, have careers in science, we have our work cut out as it relates to advocating for it, especially if the general population doesn't seem to be that aware or appreciate it. That can have serious consequences. So these are just some of the results from the first round. There's a lot more there, but it was very clear that science needs advocates and science needs more champions. And it was clear that this was not some data that 3M could keep close to their vest. This needed to be shared and we needed to foster a global conversation around this topic. So I was called upon to be the company's first ever chief science advocate. And when I got the call, I was like, what now? What role is this? Because I knew that there was no such role at 3M and I Googled it and you could see that this role, chief science advocate, doesn't exist anywhere. And my first reaction was, I can't do this. I can't do this. Because truth be told, all along while I was growing up, I never thought of myself as a science and engineering type. I was just strongly encouraged by my parents to go into the field. And I did, I followed along. I did not secure admission to top colleges. I had my share of struggles to graduate school and I actually came into 3M through the back door as a summer intern. But when I saw the results of the survey, of course, first I questioned, well, how did you define science? Who did you ask? How did you select these people? All these other questions, but quickly you realize that the problem is real because people are simply reacting to whatever their perception of science is and their perception is their reality as they say, right? So we have to work on the perception. And then it kind of all started falling together for me, my own journey, uh, as well as my experiences in raising my kids, a son and a daughter. And I took this role and I'm really glad I did. So first thing as an engineer, I broke down the problem into A, B, and C. It's very clear. A is about raising awareness and appreciation and acknowledgement of science so we can move people from this sort of apathy. Uh, second area is, of course, breaking down the biases, the boundaries, the barriers, and the beliefs. Oh, I'm not a genius. I can't do science. Or, uh, you know, what is that? Left brain, right brain myth. Or I'm a girl. Science not for me. Uh, all these things are issues. We see the portrayal of science in the media. And let me tell you, despite having two PhD scientists at home, my daughter said, I don't want to do science. That is for geeks. So that image of, of nerds and loners and maverick and uh, evil and genius and usually male scientists in the media, that isn't going to inspire little girls. Uh, I'm not sure it inspires little boys either. So that needs to be addressed and it's happening slowly. And finally, we have to focus on the context and champion and communicate that scientists solve problems and science can help improve lives. I know from my own experiences how important that context was to me. I see how important that context is to my daughter, whereas content was sufficient to motivate my son. With many girls and many boys, we need to put a different lens for communicating about STEM education and careers. And so that was part of the plan. Oh, and I should point out that's me. That's the science of makeup and lighting. And um, I managed to impress my daughter. She thought it was a good picture and I was very happy. And then she broke it gently to me, mommy, you do know that it doesn't look like you there. So I was like, you know what? I'm on the cover of a magazine and it's got my name on it right there. And she said, it's a tween magazine, mommy, really. So anyone who has teenage daughters will understand my pain and, and root for me here. And I want to let you know that now I'm on the cover of a real science magazine. So finally, she, she believes me. Uh, and my kids were also very worried when I had to get active on social media. But you have to be out there if you are going to be an advocate. And they are so worried that I'm going to embarrass myself. But we all know they were worried I would embarrass them. But communication is key, I told them. I mean, we can clearly see what the public wants. Scientists, tell us about your work and tell it to us in an easy to understand language and make it relatable. And the downside, if we don't do it, I think it is evident in the statement right here. 58% say scientists are elitist. That perception, it hurts scientists 
and it hurts science. So um, you may be wondering what else, what did we do as these results become available? It informs our science advocacy platform every year. And I'm gonna give you a sampling of the things that I've done uh, as a team over the years. And we compiled a scientists as storytellers guide. It has tips from many known uh, SciComm folks. We have Alan Alda, who founded the Institute for Science Communication. Scott Kelly, the astronaut who spent a year in space in the name of science. He's a powerful communicator. Uh, Katie Couric, uh, the broadcast journalist. Gitanjali Rao, who was the winner of 3M Young Scientist Challenge. And then she also became uh, Time Kid of the Year. Uh, and they talk about some powerful concepts as it relates to science communication. And actually, you can see right there, me and Janet uh, in the lab, my coworker, were holding up one of the tapes that I developed. This, uh, this guide is, is downloadable from the 3M website, so you can check it out. We also hosted a podcast series, and here we just pick apart the survey results and discuss the why and the how and what to do about this public perception. And we discuss with scientists and educators and inventors and innovators. And then we did a video series called Beyond the Beaker, where we profile 3M scientists as everyday people. You know, we are people with the same interests and hopes and desire to show that they're real. And we had to do that because of the data unearthed by the State of Science Index. And in 2020, we also created Science at Home series. And here we have diverse 3M scientists doing simple science experiments to keep kids engaged. Because if you remember, 55 million uh, students in US alone transitioned to distance learning very suddenly, and many of us had to work from home. And my colleagues at 3M were working hard to uh, double and then double again the production of N95 respirators. And what could we do who were not a part of that business? So we decided to do these DIY videos uh, and simple experiments that you can uh, use household materials to do, but they introduce or reinforce core scientific principles. And in the corner, you can see I did one of the experiments. It was very exciting. I had never blown up a balloon with baking soda and vinegar. And of course, my daughter was like, what kind of scientist are you? But I hadn't. Uh, check it out. Some really fun activities to try out, uh, you know, uh, in the winter break as it's coming here soon. And I also write a lot, uh, so please follow me on LinkedIn. And if their messages resonate, please help me uh, amplify it. I write about topics such as science advocacy. And what I have learned is, uh, you know, that we need to make the connection of science to everyday life. We need to keep it in the forefront. Otherwise, it's taken for granted. And then you get those shocking results. We also need to make science feel like more of a, a human endeavor as opposed to some you know, distant ivory tower thing because we can then have a chasm with the general public and it will be an issue when we need the public to follow science and we all saw how that plays out. And finally, it is important to keep talking about STEM and encouraging exposure and education. And I also talk about the multifaceted issue of girls in STEM and women in STEM. And there are issues across the spectrum from early childhood to late career. And the way I like to say it, it's time for some good old steam cleaning. S is for shattering the stereotypes. T is for telling the wholesome story about science. E is providing exposure and environment. Uh, a is for allies and advocates. We need men to be allies in this. It's not a zero sum game. We will all benefit from it. And finally, M is for metrics and measures. Um, you know, unfortunately, numbers just don't move without metrics and measures sometimes, especially in many corporate and institutional environments. So at 3M, for example, we have set very specific diversity metrics and goals. And it's a great thing because the public expects it. And we saw that in our 2020 results. Um, you know, so many of you must be wondering what else did we find out in 2020 as the pandemic was going on. So I'm happy to report that we actually did a pandemic pulse and it was taken during the pandemic and people were definitely beginning to see the need to follow the science to get out of the pandemic. And as you can see here, there was an appreciation that there are negative consequences to society if we don't value science. Um, what else was on people's mind in 2020? So you look at this list, of course, the coronavirus, but you can see a reflection perhaps of a year that it was that social justice and STEM equity also rank high along with environment. And another data point is that people see that the pandemic has highlighted the importance of STEM education. They are now more likely to agree that the world needs more people pursuing STEM to benefit society's future. They saw that link. However, there is a problem. Many say that they have been discouraged from pursuing STEM. 
And these are all the reasons. And among those who say they have been discouraged, one of the barriers you see there is gender, race, ethnicity. And by the way, this was the highest in the US compared to the global average. So we certainly have our work cut out in this area in America. So if we pull it all together, the way I like to say it is 2020 became the year to start to stem skepticism. And now we really need to advocate for science and STEM equity because people are primed. They seem ready and willing to do something about it, especially as uh, you know these four key relationships have become evident from the results. Uh, first, I call it science of health for the health of science. You know, with healthcare, science got personal. So our inherent interest in our health does provide a way in to attract people to science more generally. And I think it also gave a strategy for building an ongoing healthy relationship with the scientific process that, you know, it is dynamic. It relies on new data and ongoing debate and discourse and discussion. And that's just how it works. And it's a good thing that scientists change their mind when new data becomes available. So it was a great opportunity to tell people what the process is so that people can't politicize it easily. Second is the technology and sociology of trust revelations. We saw trust in scientists was high and even science-based corporations was high. So there's a clear opportunity for scientists and science-based companies to be visible, accessible, and active in their advocacy to bolster that foundation of public trust in science. We need that. Third, I call it the engineering of sustainable solutions. You know, during the pandemic, people saw images of nature thriving as humans took a pause. There was that image of uh, dolphins in the Venice Canal. Um, there were people in, from where I am from in India showing that they could actually see the Himalayas, uh, lower ranges for the first time. So it's not surprising that outside of healthcare, environmental impact remains the top concern because people saw that the humans have an impact and now is not the time to put sustainable solutions on the back burner, but we need to show that science has a critical role in solving sustainability challenges as well. So it gives us a very unique opportunity also to attract underrepresented minorities to STEM and build a sustainable talent pipeline because there's a lot of research out there that shows that underrepresented minorities and those who are historically marginalized have higher affinity to communal and pro-social goals. So this is great. It's a win-win. We have URM, which have more affinity to pro-social goals, and we have a need to solve all these problems. And finally, the math and equality and accountability. Uh, there's a multiplier effect when everyone in the community comes together to solve for common goals. And our res results show that people hold mostly government responsible, but they know for solving challenges around health, sustainability, and equity, most positive impact will happen with shared responsibilities. And what I mean by that is when scientists and government and business leaders and NGOs and academic institutions and individuals pull together in pursuit of common goals. So really the pandemic pulse data has given science a lifeline of support. And now it's time to double down on our efforts to stem skepticism and advocate for science and for inclusive innovation with a focus on STEM equity and diversity in STEM fields. So all this data on public perception, I'm hoping gives you insights into what people were thinking in this unique moment in time with the pandemic and the social justice issues and sustainability challenges and how it got linked up science to society and giving it a very human context. And these messages really resonate with me. I already told you, I didn't think of myself as a science and engineering type. I actually grew up on the campus of a premier engineering institution in India, the oldest engineering college in all of Asia. And I was surrounded by STEM professionals, including my dad, who was a professor there. And he has a PhD in civil engineering from England uh, himself, where I spent my early childhood. But I wasn't the child who, who tinkered or tore apart their toys. I was always more interested in the human context. And, and frankly, I just didn't see the communal goals that I had in, in STEM fields. But I still ended up uh, in STEM because of my parents and their strong encouragement. And I was actually fortunate to end up at 3M then and its culture of empowerment uh, and with its emphasis on collaboration and the communal context of improving life. So it was really a perfect fit for me. And for a kid 
who started out thinking they were not the science type. I'm currently at the level of corporate scientist. I'm the fourth woman and the first woman engineer to reach this level. I've been inducted into 3M Hall of Fame, our Carlton Society. I have 76 patents, as uh, Dr. Potsi mentioned. Uh, and in 2020, I got the highest achievement award, right, from Society of en uh, Women Engineers. And the reason why I'm dragging you through my story is that I want you to think about what I think about each and every day. How many students, how many scientists, how many ideas, and how many innovations are we all missing out on? because of how we teach, how we train, how we track, how we typify, and how we even talk about STEM. So I took the opportunity to take this message to the world when I was asked to uh, take on this additional role of 3M's first ever chief science advocate. And, and these pictures are actually from when they were filming the 3M national brand campaign, uh, the annoying lady from the 3M ads, as my daughter calls me. And in each of these ads, I decided to highlight exactly that, that I work as a scientist at 3M. My work helps people. We build on ideas and we work collaboratively. And science is a journey, not that one aha genius moment. So I can give you my spiel. What's the real shtick? It's STEM, science, humanities, technology, engineering, and math. And I think this is very important when virtually half of the world will only trust science that aligns with their beliefs. Science is not a belief system. And the only way to get us out of this trust paradox type situation is to really teach STEM with a human context, advocate for science with a societal perspective. And that should foster trust and that should instill hope. And you know what? It turns out that the very human sentiment of hope was actually the defining sentiment around science in 2021. If you remember 2021, we turned the corner on the pandemic, vaccinations became available, and countries and regions started opening up. So there was a sense of hope. And, and, and beyond dealing with the current crisis, science gave uh, hope for the future, for our planet, and for the next generation in STEM. And one thing people agreed on is that during this pandemic, scientists and medical professionals have inspired the next generation to pursue a STEM education and careers. But people around the world, 17 countries surveyed in all, say that we need to do more to encourage and keep girls and women engaged in STEM education and careers. And I'm so proud that last summer, 3M premiered a docu-series called Not the Science Type. And I'm honored to be one of the scientists featured in it. And with this docu-series, we wanted to inform, to influence, and, and hopefully inspire we wanted to catalyze this you know, sort of conversation around challenging the constructs and dismantling the archetypes and shattering the stereotypes of who enters, who persists, and who excels in STEM. We wanted to show that you know, your potential is exponential. You can blaze trails, you can pursue your passions, you can shape your careers, and you can bring in your interests like I did. I brought my interest in social sciences and humanities into STEM, and that has been a key to my success. So I want to share the trailer with you. Um, let's see. Hope this works. There's a stereotype of scientists. One, that they're male and they're boring, they don't dress well, and they're like very awkward. Uh, I'm obviously not that type. My name is Dr. Sierra Sibbles. I'm a nuclear engineer. My name is Dr. Jessica Taff. I'm a microbiologist. My name is Jay Shree Sage. I'm a scientist at 3M. My name is Gitanjali Rao. I'm 15 years old and I'm an innovator, scientist, and promoter of STEM. I was the first Black woman to get a PhD in nuclear engineering. I saw that as an opportunity to open the door. Okay, Shri, we can't that see the like uh, video. We can hear it, but we can't. We can't see the video. Oh, that's too bad. Age, race, or gender. It should be based on our capabilities and our motivation to tackle world problems. I want to tell the next generation of STEM students that you don't have to be what people expect from a scientist. The more stereotypes we break, the better outcomes we're going to have because we invite more people into the world of science. We need every diverse perspective in order to solve problems. We're ready. We're ready. If 
you inspire a girl and show her the different ways that she can do what she loves, you open their eyes. Then they look at you and think, if she can do that, I can do that. And my message to them is, yes, you can. She can change the world. We will have to put the uh, link in the chat uh, because uh, I would love for people to see this. And the reason we were super excited about this is uh, that Umesh shows up. Sarah Sevils was actually Dr. Pozzi's student who is uh, highlighted in this uh, docuseries. And we essentially wanted to communicate that you don't have to be a specific gender or race or ethnicity or nationality to be the science type. And your paths can be diverse, just as diverse as we all are. And science will be better off for that diversity. Science needs you to be you. And a diverse workforce is a robust workforce. It makes economic sense and it makes ethical sense. And it's no surprise that increasing diversity in a team, in a group, in an environment is strongly correlated with increased innovation and with positive sentiment of science in the public. And it will also lead to loyalty among increasingly progressive students, increasingly progressive customers. So we all have to work towards this. And that is why there is a lot of effort right now to ensure equitable engagement, participation, and success of those that are underrepresented or historically marginalized in these fields. I really think it's not a nice to do, it's a must do because we have all seen how it plays out. Science can be rejected. Uh, technology will not be trusted. Products will be obsoleted. It's no longer just the practice of science, but the question, who are the practitioners? It's not just the policy, but the politics come in and it's not just the people, it's also their perceptions that can lead to action or inaction and we need to address this because like i say there is no denying the world requires innovation innovation needs science science demands diversity and diversity warrants equity so what can be done to address all these inequities we have to be thinking of what i call the entire ecosystem and it involves multiple stakeholders and stakeholders from parents and teachers and educators and employers and leaders. We have to increase representation. Environments that lack diversity are closed communities. They are actually like echo chambers where the same voices will continue to reflect and continue to reverberate. And the problem sets will get identified with a very narrow point of view. And we have clearly seen that there is an urgent need for a broader perspective and a societal context for science. And we need to build a more diverse science community and science itself as a more inclusive space because a narrow view will make science itself vulnerable. And we don't want that, do we? You know, in fact, in 2022, we are already seeing that skepticism had a slight uptick. And lowest levels in 2021, when hope was defining sentiment around science, Trust is still high, but we know that the public knows that misinformation and disinformation are rampant. So we need to make sure we keep our foot on the pedal. And regardless of where we stand, we all need to facilitate diversity. We need to foster inclusion and further the cause of equity really across the spectrum. And there's a lot of work by a lot of people and organizations, but I tell you what, all of us, all of us can dig deep into our own pockets of privilege and find ways to contribute in this ecosystem. And I get this question often, so I will leave you with five ways we can all give our voice to plant the seeds of STEM in the next generation and nurture them and watch them grow into well-informed problem solvers. And really, you don't have to be in STEM yourself. Yeah, we need more science. We need more people in science. We need more uh, science-minded people. But we also need those who can communicate the social benefits of science. We need science enthusiasts. So. You can volunteer at science events. You can organize events in your community. Uh, you can inspire impressionable minds by showing how science can solve a problem they have. Uh, you can uh, champion to bring more STEM tools in your local schools. You can work with uh, local government and school boards, and you can do it through individual or organizational involvement, uh, let's say from UMESH or the university that you're at, or corporate involvement from where you work, like we do at 3M. 
Uh, you can engage in conversations with young minds that draw out their natural curiosity. And that's right. It's their natural curiosity. And they can engage in that sense and, of wonder. And we can all engage in learning together by setting an example that, yes, you can learn as an adult. And really, if you are in academia, the public should see the science community engaged with the community at large. It is good for science. It's good for scientists. And it's good for the community. So I hope uh, what I said resonates and I want to close with my own attempt to build community in STEM of making uh, hashtag 2020 count. Um, it was a tough year to say the least and especially for those of us in Minnesota. I um, um, watched what unfolded, the raw and revealing nature of uh, systemic racism and it made me really reflect what was my role in it as a very privileged South Asian immigrant. And uh, I read a lot and I thought about it a lot. And then I wanted to be productive with purpose and take action. So um, I compiled essays that I have written in this book and it was launched in uh, late 2020, The Heart of Science, Engineering Footprints, Fingerprints and Imprints. And all proceeds uh, from the sales of my book go to a scholarship for underrepresented minorities in STEM. And it is administered by the Society of Women Engineers. And uh, I have to tell you, exactly a year after the book was launched, I got invited to give the Silas Ethics Lecture at the Department of Chemical Engineering at Georgia Tech. And it was in person. And that was my first uh, in-person auditorium event. Uh, and it also happened to be the school where the recipient, the first recipient of the scholarship from the sales of this book is attending. I'm one of those people who looks for signs, signs, and I was just, uh, this is a sign. It was so great to meet her. It was a very emotional experience. And um, the day I got back, I realized I need to do more because you just see the power of what one person can do. And uh, my second book was in the making at that point. And so that was launched in March. Um, it's called Engineering Fine Print. And it covers topics around uh, tough transitions and deep reflections and meaningful actions that, that have come from the last two plus years. Uh, so I'm very thankful to Dr. Podzi and the committee at, the, at UMICH for supporting copies of my book for the seminar. So I will end exactly where I started um, with my hands. I need a hand in advocating for science. So what can you do? Uh, spread the word about the messages you heard today. Uh, from 3M Data Science Index and our science advocacy platform and buy my other book on Amazon. I know you're getting one for free, but yeah, you know, for two cups of coffee, you can buy the first one and spread the book uh, uh, and the word about the book and you will help give the gift of education. Just think about that. Um, so thank you for listening. Uh, I'm uh, very thankful for this opportunity and my, I join my hands to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sait, for your presentation. Really great, great job. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box. And while those are coming in, I'd like to ask you, um, how do we overcome unconscious bias uh, that is so negative? How do we overcome that at an individual level? Do you have any tips? Yeah, unconscious bias. I'm very conscious that we all have it. Um, there are some simple assessment tests that clearly show how biased we all are. To bias is human, and that's why we have to be aware of it. And how do we, you know, recognize and overcome it? And it's interesting. I've thought about this topic a lot, and actually written in my book. So for those who got it, will get to read it. I think we need to address it from all angles. Honestly, we think about the individual, but also we need organizational values. We need leaders talking about the importance of these values. And if we can have metrics that connect to these values, they also help to drive behavior at an individual level. Because you're right, at the end of the day, it comes down to each one of us and we have to understand, we have to monitor and cut down bias so we can stitch together the culture that, that is positive. So four ways if you want to overcome bias uh, at an individual level. Number one, speak up. When you witness what you think is bias, address it respectfully. Because if we say stay silent, uh, then we are causing it to be perpetrated. And by the same token, we need to be okay with people pointing out something that we may be doing. 
I will tell you, my kids pointed out that I was using the word guys in a mixed gender meeting. And I guess I had to, oh yes, I did. And so I think we have to normalize it that we have to point out nicely to each other if we may be doing something. Second thing is check in. Reach out to people casually. And I have come to realize really the power that informal conversations have. It's this one-on-one -on -one connection which builds trust. And so once you have trust, you are able to give that feedback when it is warranted. Number three, venture out. Connect with people outside your immediate circles. You know, all these interactions facilitate new touch points with people outside your work group or outside your lab from different functions, background, roles, perspectives. And it doesn't feel comfortable at first, but that sense of discomfort then becomes a motivation for examining your own bias. And the fourth one is pin down. Continually keep questioning your own biases. It is difficult to identify, very hard to admit to having it despite the fact that we all have it. So we may also be unaware of the impact it has on others. And in my case, really having this network with younger folks is a great exercise because it makes me think and pin down my own biases and what shaped my worldviews and how they need to evolve. So really my Gen Z kids have been instrumental in helping me adjust my uh, mental models. So speak up, check in, venture out, pin down and this in out up down framework can really give that 360 view uh, to have bias for action. Mm, thank you. Those are great. Uh, let's see other question. Um, can you talk a bit about the importance of mentoring in the STEM field, both in recruiting and uh, retaining uh, folks who are traditionally underrepresented in STEM? Yeah, I think uh, mentorship is very important at critical transitions and decisions, and especially for those who are historically marginalized and especially in STEM fields, because I think you need accessible role models from the community who can help navigate the barriers, you know, real and perceived, and that can really be a game changer. I mean, if I look back and appreciate the privilege of having parents and peers where navigation wasn't an issue at all, I've come to realize for many that is the tremendous barrier. It's the barrier, that ability to navigate. So mentorship is critical for that. And in general also, I think mentorship is good, but I want to say something here. I have to say, so are relationships and partnerships and friendships. You know, at the end of the day, no one else is as responsible as you are for your own success. So what I found is the most important is to have menteeship. And what I mean by that is you need to have the ability to learn from others. So if you want a really a mentor, develop menteeship, start listening, observing, learning from those around you, develop that skill, and you will find that there are mentor moments that matter everywhere. And full disclosure, in my almost 30 years at 3M, I have never had a mentor except for an official mentor through a diversity mentoring program uh, one year. But I have had a lot of relationships and partnerships and friendships. And I did fine without a mentor because in looking back, that menteeship has paid rich dividends. So at the end of the day, the mentor is just a sounding board. And so having relationships and partnerships and friendships Instead of putting all my mentoring stock into one person, I was able to learn from many and talk with many and allowed me to be shaped by many and allowed me to shape many. So do not freak out if you don't have mentors. Make sure you have menteeship. I don't mean to be a contrarian, but I think it's an immense focus on the task of getting the mentor, but not the outcome. I just want to ease the pressure on young folks. You don't have to check the box on having a mentor. You don't have to be in a hurry to find one. They will come, do good work, talk about your work, but nurture relationships, foster friendships, and bolster partnerships. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, at the university, uh, we often think about how can we, as faculty, uh, help women in STEM uh, feel more included? Um, do you have tips for that? Yeah, so um, I have to say, um, you know, I'm not in that environment anymore, but I was at one point and I was the only woman in a lab of 14. Uh, and I'm fairly certain in looking back that that did have an impact on my sense of engagement 
and the efforts that were made or not made to make me feel included. So I think the question you're raising is very real and very pertinent. And I'm really hopeful that in 30 years since I've been out of school that things have changed. So based on what I know and I've learned and I've gathered and talking to a lot of people, I think we talked about some of it already. We have to change the constructs. We have to make sure that they don't hinder women in your classroom. It's easy to keep doing what you're doing, but it is warranted that you, you know, re-examine your classroom practices and make sure they account for the diversity in the room in terms of the setup, in terms of engagement, in terms of participation. And uh, not only that, think about relevant examples. Think about role models. Think about cultural content. Think about cultural context. Um, then also work hard to dismantle the archetype. Be cognizant of that. Not everyone fits that mental archetype. So don't inadvertently feed into it in your classrooms. You know, you have to shatter the stereotypes and you have to be the one debunking those myths. Um, I can tell you something concrete. You can talk about the skills that appeal to women as well. I can tell you the one reason, the only reason I feel I've succeeded in STEM is because of my soft skills, which by every measure are harder than the so-called hard skills. And the immense focus on agentic goals that we have, and we minimize the discussion of communal goals, these hinder engagement from women and underrepresented minorities. So talk about purpose. Talk about purpose of science. Talk about the things that science can do. That will increase that sense of engagement and belonging. So make sure you're talking about both sides. And talk about what it takes. And, and, and know that the heroic stories of the loner scientists had way more than the loner scientists involved. So don't feed into those stereotypes. Uh, and, and stop any kind of tokenism and typecasting. I know that happens. Remember, women are already few and they're already highly visible and they, are, they don't represent the entire gender. So be careful. Don't feed into that urge to treat women as a monolith and men as individuals. Um, so just some food for thought there. Great, great points. Yep, absolutely. And uh, when we have groups of students working together, you know, just to be vigilant that everyone uh, is able to contribute to the best of their abilities and we're not stereotyping women and underrepresented minorities uh, to perform certain tasks. That's Absolutely. That and, and seek their feedback. Uh, what I've learned is they're not shy about giving you feedback. You just have to ask, how can I make this more inclusive? How can I make this more pertinent? What can I do? What is it that I'm doing that's helping or not helping? And then take all of that and discuss as a faculty with other faculty and figure out what it is that you will implement and thank the students for giving you feedback and then do so. Absolutely. So we have a few questions in the in the chat, in the Q&A here. Um, the first one has to do with the changes that we've seen during the pandemic and that you outlined in your talk, um, asking, are these changes that, that we saw, are these being sustained? Um, that's the that's the million dollar question. Are they going to be sustained? And but we know what we need to do as a science community because let's accept the fact that what was yesterday is all going to be forgotten, and people will forget that science was such a savior in in this in this situation that we were in. So the best way to keep instilling that sense of Yes, science is important, is to do those things that we talked about, make science visible, make it relatable, make scientists as a persona more accessible, communicate in a way that appeals to people, and make sure that you are connecting up science to a social and human context. So if people are seeing sustainability challenges, linking up those challenges to science is important and say, yes, we can solve these problems and this is how that impacts. So I think sometimes, even in the science community, we find it hard to accept that we have to change a little bit as well in the ways we communicate and the ways we operate to make sure that the public sentiment stays where it is. We have to work hard at it. And I know sometimes the sense in scientists was, 
You don't need to know how that works. It works. It's magic and, and, and it's fine. But these days, our society has become that we need to do a little bit of, uh, you know, being out there and saying it is science that delivered these results, etc. So it's a fine balance. But I think we have to figure out how to navigate it because it is important. Uh, to have a public perception of science that is positive because it impacts whatever we do, whatever products we develop, whatever science research you do, all of that is beholden to how the public feels. So it is our duty and obligation uh, and uh, the sense of urgency around making sure we can sustain this positive image of science that it's having right now. Right. And we're very excited to find out what happens uh, next year because we're committed to doing the survey again so i'll be back and maybe in yeah. person this time so i can do all my hand waving that would be great um according to a recent report by the pew research center underrepresented minorities in stem earn much less than their white counterparts what is being done at 3m and other companies to address pay equity uh very happy to report 100% pay equity, and we have our goal, a sustainability goal to maintain that uh, around the world. So we're very excited about that. So like I said, put those goals, put those metrics, make them visible. Transparency is important. Lots of mm -hmm. other things. We have uh, diversity initiatives. We have, uh, so let me start with uh, underrepresented minority and STEM uh, and STEM education initiatives. Many, many of those, in fact, a recent goal to have 5 million unique STEM opportunities for underrepresented students. Then at the college level, we have a program called Ascend, which is more about those navigation skills. It is for underrepresented minorities to understand what it is to interview. How do you get uh, internships? Because a lot of people who get hired into corporations are people who have interned there. But if you don't know how to go for internship and you don't know how to navigate that, if you don't know how to have a resume and interview, those skills are critical. So we did a program called Ascend just for those students. Then we have a program called RISE, Raising Influence in Science and Engineering, where we actually invite graduate students who are underrepresented and they give their presentations at 3M. Uh, we have been doing it virtually lately, of course. And then those uh, students are invited uh, uh, in, our, in our recruiting efforts. Uh, and then at work, we have all sorts of diversity challenges. We're gonna double the pipeline of diverse talent in management and stuff like that. So yes, demand transparency, look at it very carefully. Are people doing that? And are they really helping to solve these problems? And this is a problem all the way uh, to national level, as you point out uh, the research uh, from the Pew uh, survey. And I'm very excited to report that just two weeks ago, I was invited to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to discuss exactly that, uh, the, the problem and then the issues of STEM equity. So everybody's aware of it and we're trying real hard and everybody has to do their part because there's no one magic wand that can fix the problem. So think about what you are doing as an individual every single day and don't think that you can't do something. You can, just think hard enough. Hmm. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, probably this is going to be the last question. Um, how do you imagine we can improve the public perception of science while also maintaining public critical literacy of science? Very important point. Um, it ties in so much more than what I am even capable of uh, thinking and, and explaining. But from my own vantage point, what you just asked is pulling together education. It's pulling together how parents behave and uh, social perception of what science is and isn't. It's pulling together our colleges and it's pulling together employment and then the public. So we have to work across this entire spectrum. We have to elevate the level of science yet make it more accessible. We have to make sure that we are bringing in the kind of diversity that can allow people to see that it is benefiting their community. Sometimes we think about it only in terms of macro problems, which really aren't the problems at a regional, local, at a communal level. And so the way we talk about it has to change. Uh, and then the education. Are we doing enough to maintain and retain and engage uh, a wider swath of the public 
or is it just being relegated to a small minority? And if people develop this attitude that it's not for me, it's for them, then it becomes us versus them, not just that minority, but also against the entire field. So open to any suggestions. We think about it all the time. We try to work at the community and education level. We support science teachers. We have programs like TWIST where science teachers come to 3M to see how science is brought to life so that they can go back to their classrooms and bring science to life for their students. Uh, we have partnerships with faculty, and then we have all sorts of efforts that, as you see, we're doing with the public. Even things like science at home encourages parents to get involved with their kids by using baking soda and vinegar, let's say, to build up a balloon, and then slowly being pulled into their interest and curiosity and wonder. So a lot of things that can be done across the board. I don't have the magic answer, but I say all of the above. Mm -hmm. And some. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Say, for spending time with us today and um, really um, talking about uh, your passion for this important topic. And it really came through today. So thank you so much um, for joining us.